Good morning, welcome to uh, St. John's Church in Buckhurst Hill. My name's Ian Farley, I'm the rector of the church. Uh, if you're a member of our normal church uh, family, good morning to you and uh, we pray that you would enjoy worshipping with those of us who are able to lead here in the church. And if you're a stranger to our church family, we welcome you too. And we pray that you would be blessed uh, by participating in this church service with us. Let me begin with an opening prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us and all the world. Thank you that you welcome us into your presence. Thank you that you are delighted to receive our praises. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you speak to us through your word and thank you that you bless our fellowship. We pray that you would anoint us wherever we are with your Holy Spirit, that we may know we are in your presence and that you are waiting to minister to us. In the name of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to say uh, some responses together, which will appear uh, on your screens, and then we will continue to worship in song. Be with us, Spirit of God. Nothing can separate us from your love. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with your saving power. Speak to us, wisdom of God. Bring strength, healing, and peace.
the earlier part of that uh, great song we talked about or sung about being gathered at the cross where our Saviour died for us. We're going to spend a little while in prayer, beginning with an act of confession. Every Christian is someone who knows that Jesus died for their sin. And so when we come together, we acknowledge our sin and our frailty and our weakness in the confidence of God's love and forgiveness. So let us join in a prayer of confession. God the Father forgives us in Christ and heals us by the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore put away all anger and bitterness all slander and malice, and confess our sins to God our Redeemer. Your word convicts us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Your word commands us, repent and believe the good news. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your word assures us Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so as Christians forgiven and healed, we can bring our prayers to God. We're going to start by praying as God's word instructs us for those who are in positions of authority. So Heavenly Father, we pray for our Prime Minister and Cabinet and members of Parliament as they seek to lead us through the current coronavirus that we are in. We pray that we would give them benefit rather than judgment. For none of us, Father, seem to know quite what is going on or what to do. So we pray for those in positions of authority, both nationally and locally, in our cities and towns, and rural areas of our country, that they may have wisdom and sensitivity, perception and discernment, and we pray for humility, and we ask that no one would be seeking personal power or control. And Heavenly Father, we pray for all those in our world of science and medicine, and particularly for those who are seeking to find uh, some cure or some suitable vaccine or medicine to help us in the situation we are in. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as God's word also instructs us, we should have a particular concern for the poor. And so both for our own country and perhaps particularly also for other parts of the world where many, many people live in poverty and for whom the situation we are in may be quite desperate. 
with no income and no help from outside. And for those who live in shanty towns or are stuck together, as it were, in large numbers with nowhere to go, for whom this situation is dangerous. Father, we pray, therefore, for leaders of the nations throughout the world. And we ask that there may be cooperation between the powerful and the less powerful, and for cooperation between the rich and the less rich, and for cooperation between those who seem to be coping and for those for whom this is overwhelming. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And loving Heavenly Father, we pray for those for whom the current situation may be more of a struggle for other reasons, for those who are already ill, and who may either be lacking the care that they need or for whom their illness is exacerbated. And we pray, Father, for families. We pray particularly for those who are in single parent families and for whom this long time of the summer may be a harder period of time. For day after day, they are by themselves looking after children. We pray that there may be neighbours who know and care and are able to help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we join together in the words that our Saviour taught us. So we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so in confidence that we have a loving Heavenly Father who delights to hear our prayers, we can open our hearts, our minds, and our voices in song. And we continue to praise God together. It occurred to me during the week that um, your life goes in phases. Uh, quite often they're determined by my age. And you come across phases you don't expect. Life's like that. This virus is something none of us expected at the beginning of the year. We were just finished celebrating Christmas and here we are. You can go through phases in other parts of your life too sometimes, of work family relationship, sometimes in your church family relationship. If you're going through a phase in any one of those things right now, you can be a bit confused and a bit troubled. I'd suggest sometimes the best thing to do is just hit the reset button. 
and do this. And the things of earth will grow strange in the light of his glory. So that I by hour, you will know his power till at last you have run the race. And you can also focus on this every day. Every minute of every day, every conversation, thought, action, reaction, you can reset with this.
On our Sunday mornings here at St. John's over recent months, we've been thinking about the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And uh, we're coming today to just consider actually one sentence from the Bible, but uh, we're going to do a bit of preparatory stuff before we get to it. And uh, so far, we've looked at Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, the first person uh, who saw him on the first Easter Sunday, very early in the morning. Uh, and then after that, he appeared to two or three women, other women who were just walking along the road, uh, ladies who used to help him in his ministry in Galilee. After that, he appeared to Peter by himself. And then fourthly, all still on the same day, he appeared to two men who were walking along the road out of Jerusalem to a village about seven miles away. They then turn around and go back to Jerusalem, and Jesus appears again for a fifth time on this first day. He may have appeared more times, but five are recorded. And he appears in a room, a locked room, uh, to uh, ten or nine of the disciples. After that, a week later, and again, there may have been many other appearances in between, he appears again to the disciples in that room. After that, he appears to uh, seven of them uh, in Lake Galilee. They're the appearances we've looked at so far. Today, I want to do what is called an apologetic sermon. Uh, so if you are a Christian, I'm going to suggest four things that you could share with non-Christian friends. If you're listening in and you wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian, then here are four things for you to think about and reflect on. And the sermon really relates to the question, what's the evidence? I mean, it's a question that most of us are thinking about. What actually is the evidence for wearing face masks? Is it helpful or is it not? And we may have different opinions on that. And most of us, I guess, are getting our news either, you know, from modern media or still from printed newspapers, and different things are said. And there are arguments on both sides. What's the evidence? And we might apply the same question to all sorts of things. What's the evidence for a Loch Ness monster? A blurry photo from the 1950s, is that it? Or what's the evidence for doing things to save the planet? I only know one little bit of this, so I might as well share that little bit with you. I did a funeral service uh, just a few years back for a friend of mine whose wife had died. And um, they had decided, before she died, obviously, uh, that they would make a contribution to not destroying rainforests and all that kind of thing, and she would have a wicker um, basket, if you like, for her body to be in, rather than what most people have in terms of um, a wooden coffin. And of course, I thought, oh, well, that's very commendable until 
uh, I talked with some of the people who work behind the scenes, if you like, in a crematoria. Uh, and of course, what they pointed out to me was that without the wood, they had to have a higher source of power from elsewhere in order for somebody to be cremated. And that's far from using less fuel. If you used a wicker basket, you were using more. Now, I wouldn't know that kind of thing if I hadn't had the conversation with those who were working in that way. What is the evidence for God? And the Bible gives us at least uh, four clear indicators of evidence for God. There may be many more, but I'm just sharing these four with you this morning. So firstly, in Acts chapter 17, we find the Apostle Paul is uh, speaking in Athens. And uh, in Athens was still a, a major city of the day, although the Roman Empire was supplanting the Greek Empire, certainly militarily and in terms of power. But Athens remained, if you like, an intellectual center of the world. And the Apostle Paul is wandering around the streets of Athens and he's looking at hundreds of different temples and statues to all those kind of gods that you might still know the names of today. And in order to share about Jesus' heavenly father, our heavenly father, the God who created everything, he quoted these words, verse 28 of Acts chapter 17. In him, that is God Almighty, in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets, that's Athenian poets, have said, we are indeed his offspring. And the point the Apostle Paul is making here is that simply to exist as a human being on the earth is actually evidence of an existence of God. Because all of us live and move and have our being in him. We haven't self-created ourselves. No, we are in some way encapsulated, every human being who has ever lived within God. In him we live and move and have our being. Which is why, of course, people even ask a question, who am I and where have I come from? You wouldn't even think about the question if it were not true that we live and move and have our being in God. So the sheer existence of human life, argues the scriptures or the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, is evidence that there is a God. Then secondly, in writing a letter to the Christians in Rome, uh, the Apostle Paul, who had never actually been to Rome at this point in his life, was making some general statements about God. And in the first chapter and the 20th verse, we read this. His, that is God the Father's attributes, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
in the things that have been made. So this isn't talking about human existence, it's talking about the world in which mankind lives. And his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So the argument here is that if you open your eyes and look around you, the things you see are evidence of the existence of God. Every flower, every tree, every mountain, every pond, every tadpole, every toad, every stickleback, every hummingbird, there were two different kinds of woodpeckers in our garden at the same time this week. I can never remember which is which, but there was a green one, which I think might be the lesser spotted one, and there was one that was red and black, which might be the greater spotted one, I'm not quite sure. But both of them were digging up the ants, I was saying, eat, 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 eat more. And there they were in the garden, both at the same time. If you open your eyes and look around you, if you delight in all the nature programs that you might be enabled to see in all the wonders of our current technological world, if you love David Attenborough and all his productions, if you enjoy just going out for a walk and watching the wind blow, all of these things, says the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, every created thing is evidence of God. And we should open our eyes and see the wonders of the world. So that's a second argument from Scripture about the existence of God. But then a third argument, and these two are about Jesus, occurs when the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 26 is on trial for his life. He's been arrested, uh, he's in the land of Israel, and he was uh, arrested in Jerusalem, but then taken to the coast to a town of Caesarea, and there he's put on trial. And the Roman governor and indeed the king of the uh, area are both there listening to Paul. And he's telling them about Jesus and he makes this statement in Acts chapter 26, verse 26, to the king, this has not been done in a corner. The life of Jesus has not been lived in a corner. It hasn't been hidden, it has been publicly displayed. And you, O oh King, he goes on, you know it. You actually know all these things. I think often today we have a completely wrong understanding of Jesus' three years of ministry. We can make it ecclesiastical, we can soften it down, we can think it's a procession of this event and then this event and then this event, all kind of steadily going along. When in reality, from the first day to the last, it was rumbustious in the extreme. Jesus hardly ever had a spare moment. There was hardly any time except in the middle of the night at the top of a mountain where he was by himself. He was utterly and completely surrounded by people day after day after day after day after day after day. Of course he was, because rapidly and clearly the message spread around that this guy, this wandering rabbi up there in Galilee, he heals everybody of everything, every time everywhere. Let's just say that again. 
the message that was spreading around was that this Galilean wandering rabbi healed everybody of everything every time everywhere well what would you be doing this is a time where there aren't hospitals this is a time where doctors are rare this is a time without anesthetics this is a time of very limited knowledge of the human body but evidently people are blind and evidently people are lepers and evidently people can't walk and evidently people can't talk and evidently people are possessed or mentally ill with all sorts of things that was your friend or your child or your parent what would you be doing the answer is you'd be doing what thousands of other people were doing you'd go and find him here is a woman who has been ill for 12 years with something internal inside her and nobody has the foggiest idea what it is or what to do about it and she's wasted all her money on every doctor she can find and she's worse off. But we read, she had heard about Jesus. So she goes to Jesus, she finds Jesus and in the midst of a crowd, says to herself, if only I could touch him, I will be healed. And she does touch him. And she is healed. Because Jesus heals everybody of everything, everywhere, every time. So there are crowds and crowds and crowds of people around Jesus. Every day of his ministry for three years, never alone. Thousands and thousands of people. So that when he turns up in Jerusalem, the place is absolutely manic, jam-packed. These things, says the Apostle Paul 30 years later, these things were not done in a corner. And if you're the kind of person who's thinking about the Christian faith and you think, well, you know, it was 2,000 years ago and what do we know? The answer is we know an awful lot because Jesus displayed himself publicly. And indeed, he himself says to those who are against him, you know, I've done all this in the open. We're not talking about some side affair in a dark corner in a valley up there in the north. We're talking about a whole nation stirred up. These things were not done in a corner. But then fourthly and lastly, and specifically on the resurrection, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6 this. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom are still alive. Most of whom are still alive. More than 500. See, when we think about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, we think of ones and twos and fives and tens. Mary, one person. Two or three other women. Two men walking along the road. Peter, one man. Disciples in a closed room. Ten or eleven or maybe a few more of them. And again, seven of them up in Lake Galilee. But here we are told, Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. And these people are still alive, in this case, 25 years later. That's 500 people 
I saw Jesus, I saw Jesus, I saw Jesus. The man who was crucified on the cross, the man who was dead in both, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him. How many witnesses do you want? Before you would believe. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saw Jesus risen from the dead. At the end of the day, that is the bedrock of the Christian faith. We're not following some cleverly devised myth, the Apostle writes in one of his letters. We're not following something made up. We have people we can go to who will tell us, I saw him. 500 people have not yet seen the Loch Ness Monster, so you might be wise to be hesitant about believing it. But more than 500 people have seen the risen Lord Jesus. At the end of the day, a Christian declaration of faith can be reduced to three words. Jesus is alive. That's what a Christian believes. Jesus is alive. Who was this Jesus? Well, we know all sorts of things about him because he didn't do his life and ministry in a corner. He publicly displayed it. And actually, we know he was sent from God the Father, the one who made all the world and everything you can see. And anyway, I'm a human being here, and I ask these kind of questions because ultimately, I live and move and have my being in God. What's the evidence? The evidence is quite strong. You might want to think about it. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Some more words to take with us out into whatever we're facing this week. He's alive, all right. And this is what you can do for us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I Yeah.
you're a regular member of our church family, then there'll be uh, information on the church updates for what's going on in the week ahead. And we have a service this evening, and if you're listening from anywhere, you're welcome to join us uh, at uh, 7 o'clock this evening. Let me close with a prayer of blessing that we may each know, whoever we are and whatever circumstances we are in, that we have a God who will not let go of us ever. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you that we may know that you are with us wherever we go and whatever may be going on. And we pray for any who may have particular fears of their health or their income in these current days. And so we ask that we may find our peace in you. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us all this day and always.